then I hit the start webinar button. And that's where we'll see people come in the attendees. Welcome friends. We're going to get started in just a moment and let folks fill in the room. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm going to put a link into the chat box for tonight's document. This has library news, upcoming announcements, as well as links to our speaker, author. And then as we chat tonight and as um, Jasmine does her presentation, we'll do some live resources if they come up and add those to the list. And lots of links back to the library, of course. So we'll keep, uh, we'll open in just a few moments. If you know what native land you're joining us from, you can put that in there. And if you don't know, you can look it up on that map, native land. Welcome. Hello. It's nice to virtually see you. I can see your names. I can feel your spirit. All right, it's seven o'clock. Let's get started. Again, thank you for being here tonight. And this is part of SFPL's Women's Her Story Month. And I have just also finished celebrating Black History Month, which was January and February, which we call more than a month. And then deep into her story, and I have been able to meet the most amazing women in these two campaigns. And I'm so excited tonight to continue with that journey and not only have Jasmine Darsnick, but also joining us is librarian Christine Moretta, who is the curator of our historic photography collection. So amazing women all around, and I thank you for being part of it as well. Like I said, this is part of her story, and we do have a couple more events coming up. Lots of book lists, lots of resources for you to find out about all of the amazing women in the world and in San Francisco. We do want to acknowledge that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rami Tushaloni peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Ramyatush community. And right now I'm throwing in the chat and I see that I've been throwing all those chats to the host. So forgive me, I will throw them in again later. So here's the um, links to the resource list of uh, many, many things indigenous, First Peoples, particularly on Ohlone land and great websites you can learn more about. We'll also have reading lists. We love our reading lists at the library and sites that you could donate to. Um, tomorrow, we have these amazing humans part of the 1619 program. And this event is at 1030 in the morning and it, it is kind of youth focused, but wow, these amazing humans, it's gonna be great. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Nicole Hannah-Jones and artivist Nicholas Smith in Convo. And this will be live on YouTube only. So check it out there. And I think it is time sensitive. So you won't wanna miss this. And I just popped it in the chat. SFPL celebrates uh, on the same page, which is our bi-monthly read in San Francisco, where we encourage you all to read the same books at the same time. And this March and April, we're celebrating Pulitzer Prize winning poet, po Natalie Diaz, for her book, Post-Colonial Love Poem. You can pick this book up now at any of our library locations, and she will be in conversation with Michelle Cruz Gonzalez, educator, uh, artist, and ex-punk rock drummer. And that will happen Tuesday the 26th. And then we have a book club prior to the author visit, so come check that out. We have not had many po poetry books, so I think it's gonna be a good conversation. And then on Saturday, we have the amazing Wanda Sabir curates a, a panel of women talking about wombfulness gathering. And you will have to come see what that exactly means. And then the amazing, I miss the 20th Century Cafe so much. I want a piece of honey cake and butterscotch drink, hot butterscotch. Uh, Michelle Polzine, owner of what was 20th Century Cafe, 
will come talk about her journey as a small business entrepreneur and now a cookbook author and what she's up to now, Tuesday, March 22nd, 7 p.m. in the virtual library. And of course, none of this is not, not oh, I really need to change that slide. None of this is not, uh, po with, not possible without the help of our friends of the library who did and he help, did help us with more than a month, but also help us with her story and all the programs we do at the library. So thank you friends for all of your support and what you bring to us. All right, without further ado, I am happy to introduce Jasmine Darsnick. And Jasmine's book has been floating around my office to everyone. I think there's about seven people in my department. It's been floating from desk to desk. Um, we knew that we wanted to get Jasmine at the library and it's just a matter of time. And I think this is the perfect month. This book is a really old ode to women and an ode to San Francisco. Jasmine Darsnick's um, debut novel, Song of a Captive Bird, was a New York Times book review editor's choice, an LA Times bestseller, and long listed for the Center for Fiction Prize and award, awarded the Writer's Center First Novel Prize. Darsnick is also the author of the New York Times bestselling The Good Daughter, a memoir of my mother's hidden life. Her books have been published in 17 countries. She was born in Tehran, Iran, and came to America when she was five years old. She holds an MFA in fiction from Bennington College, a JD from the University of California, and a PhD in English from Princeton. And she is now a professor of English and creative writing at the California College of Arts. And I think that's fascinating that she teaches English to artists. It's gonna be, I hope we talk about that. Um, and she lives in the Bay Area with her family. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Jasmine. You can put your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. And YouTube, we welcome you as well. We'll bring back your questions too. All right, I'm going to stop sharing. Turn it over, Jasmine. Thank you so much, Anissa. So I always, I, I can't not say this. Uh, I came to America as a child and libraries were my home. They were my refuge. And I still feel like you can plunk me down pretty much anywhere on the planet. And as long as I can find my way to the library, I'm gonna be okay. So this, uh, yeah, hashtag library love <laughs> for sure and forever. This um, this evening is so special to me um, because of that and also because it's Women's History Month and because I get to share um, Bohemians, which is a love letter to San Francisco. So this just is the perfect, um, I've been looking forward to this conversation for so long. I'm going to be talking about Bohemians and the amazing women artists who populate its pages, uh, the world of 1920 San Francisco, their art, their lives, their photography. We'll also have time for questions at the end, so make sure um, to, to um, ask any questions that you have of me. I'm going to share my screen. I've got lots of pictures tonight and lots of stories, so I'm going to pop over if you give me a sec to my photographs. Oh, is that moment? Aha. And thank you for your patience through that awkwardness. Okay. And hopefully now you just see my my photograph and the cover of the Bohemians. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, thank you, Anissa. I am um, I am. Um, unable to see anything but my own screen, so I appreciate that. All right, so Bohemians um, is a novel about Dorothea Lange, this woman over here sitting atop her car during the Depression, one of our great American photographers. Dorothea Lange is um, sometimes not known by name. Some people only know her by the photograph that she took in 1936. This is her photograph, 19, in 1936 photograph, Migrant Mother. Uh, and it is probably one of the most reproduced photographs of all time. Um, certainly has, um, has been associated with her sometimes almost exclusively. This is the one work that people know about Lang. The Bohemians, uh, my novel, the novel I'm gonna talk about tonight, peels back the years and it takes us to San Francisco and it introduces us to Lang before she was an icon, when she was just, uh, she was a young woman 
and she was new she was new to the city and she was discovering herself san francisco was the place where dorothea lang said she found herself so even though we don't often associate her with san francisco or the 20s there's no doubt in my mind that for Dorothea Lange, this was the place. This was the place that transformed her and electrified her and activated her. There are places that happen to you and places that you choose. For Lange, San Francisco was both of these things. She was 23 years old when she arrived in San Francisco. Here she is at about that time in 1918. She thought she was just passing through town. Instead, she stayed for the rest of her life. The city that she found, San Francisco, in 1918, was only really just a decade old, having been almost totally destroyed in the earthquake and fires of 1906. Then, as now, it was a city at the edge of the continent, a place of beauty and promise and also tragedy. So here we've got the iconic Ferry building, this would have greeted Dorothea Lange. This is 1927, so a few years later, but the, the ferry building would have been her first um, point of entry into San Francisco. And if you just notice in the background, no bridges yet, no, really it seems like the whole East Bay is just a wash of hills at this point. It wasn't, but it was a, it was a much, um, it was a much quieter place. It was a much different place than the San Francisco and the Bay Area that we all know now. In May of 1919, the month that she arrived, soldiers were shipping out by the thousands from the West Coast and the Spanish flu was advancing into the city. The first wave was about to hit. In Lang's time, North Beach, which is the area that would become so important to her and is also very important to the Bohemians, was still populated by Italian families who'd come over in the 19th century to work as fishermen, on the nearby waterfronts. Mexican and Irish enclaves also existed, though their populations were far less robust than they'd been in the 19th century. The residents of this part of town, North Beach, were laborers, artisans, farmers, mechanics, shopkeepers, fishermen, working class people living in humble cottages, some dating back to the 1850s. The bright many days of the jazz age were glimmering off in the distance, but for women, this was already a time of possibility. This, um, this illustration, this uh, comic from the era shows two women on the left. Uh, you've got a woman at about 1910. On the right, you've got a woman in 1920. So just a decade of time saw such tremendous changes in women's life and lives. And of course, fashion was one uh, way those changes got registered. I, I don't have the um, the title on here, but the, the title, the caption for this illustration is what a difference a decade makes. And it did make a huge difference in the lives of women. In the first decades of the 20th century, just to set a stage for you for Bohemians and for Lang's entry into San Francisco, young women especially were in open rebellion against the past. Lang had first joined this rebellion in her native New Jersey. She was born in Hoboken. Uh, but its most delightfully raucous interludes took place in San Francisco. And here are some of our delightfully raucous San Francisco ladies. This would have been pretty uh, risque. They're flashing um, their, their calves here. It looks like they're getting, they're boarding maybe a train here. Um, these San Francisco ladies were probably, I'd say, at the forefront of um, the liberation movement. Now, of course, women in California had gotten the vote earlier than women in the rest of the country. So when Lane comes in 1918, she's entering a pretty progressive place, a place where relatively women are, um, are, are, are already actively claiming their spaces and their places in the city. Here are a couple of other San Francisco ladies. They're out at Ocean Beach. Um, looks like they're about to, oops, sorry. <laughs> See, they're so wily, they won't, uh, they won't sit still long enough for me. So these ladies are at the beach. Um, and these ladies that insist on being shown um, are partaking of alcohol. And it is impossible, of course, to talk about the 1920s without talking about prohibition and the way San Francisco observed prohibition or actually more to the point, didn't observe prohibition. So for the minute that uh, the sale of alcohol becomes illegal in 1920, San Francisco just was not having it. 
The city had more bars than any other city in the United States, and most of them were located in North Beach. The Legion Club, the Spotlight, the Colony Club, these and myriad others made San Francisco the, quote, wettest city in the West. Prohibition um, had been spearheaded by white Anglo Protestants back East when in the Midwest. In San Francisco in 1920, San Francisco is a city of immigrants, really. Two thirds of the city res residents are immigrants or have at least one immigrant parent. For the Italians, the Irish, the Jews, the Germans, alcohol was simply part of their culture. They wouldn't and they didn't give it up. I think you can, you can see that the, these ladies are very happily partaking there. And in San Francisco, um, Oh, uh, bootleggers were almost thought of as public servants. The coastal fog for which San Francisco is so well known provided the perfect cover for smuggling um, liquor across uh, from the coast into the city. And to keep things flow flowing in 1926, San Francisco actually passed a law against prohibition. They passed a law against prohibition. So there's the spirit of San Francisco in the 1920s. It defies uh, prohibition by passing its own edict against uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, the illegality of liquor. So a thing about women and drinking, um, by pushing drinking underground in the United States, prohibition actually made women partake of alcohol more. For the ladies, the allure of the speakeasy culture in these years was far more tempting than the musty old saloons where drinking had been the province of just men until pro prohibition. In San Francisco, uh, most of the nightlife, most of this um, <laughs> defiance of prohibition is happening in North Beach and then in the old Barbary Coast. Um, these are these, uh, these storied venues like the Hippodrome, Spider Kelly's. These are the places where the liquor is flowing and the sexes are mixing and also where San Franciscans are, are hearing jazz for the first time. So it's in the old Barbary Coast, these venues, in the quote, black and tan establishments that San Franciscans are first listening to jazz music. And all of this is a stone's throw away from where Dorothea Lange is about to make her home in the city. Here we've got a slew of folks enjoying themselves in the city around about this time. It looks like it's New Year's Eve, but I don't think in San Francisco you needed much reason for a celebration. It was also a segregated city. So as much as it was a glittering and beautiful and wondrous place, it was also a place of tremendous discrimination and, um, and a lot of hardship for a particular pop population. And that was the Chinese in San Francisco. In the Bohemians, you get this story through Dorothea Lange's assistant. Dorothea Lange, when she comes to San Francisco in 1918 and establishes her studio, has a Chinese American assistant. And through her, though she is not mentioned much in Dorothea Lange's biography. She's a big part of the Bohemians. And through this character, Caroline Lee, Dorothea Lange's assistant, Dorothea becomes very aware of what's happening in the city, um, becomes aware of the prejudices and the violence um, that are particularly against women in this time. These were real campaign posters, by the way. The one time mayor, then Senator from California, ran on a campaign, Keep California White in 1920. And these campaign posters would have been papered around the city in those first years when Dorothea Ling arrives here on the West Coast. It's Chinatown, the area where the Chinese were relegated was um, the only place where the Chinese were allowed to live in San Francisco. And it was, um, it was a place for women of a special, it was a, an especially difficult, hard time for women because many of the women who came over from China to America during this era were survivors of the human trafficking that was flourishing in San Francisco at the time. And that's a story also that's told in the Bohemians through the, the character of Caroline Lee. Now, this place, uh, Montgomery Block, uh, Montgomery Block is, uh, was an artist colony that stood, that stood where the Transamerica Pyramid stands now. It was built as the largest, for decades it was the largest and also safest office building in San Francisco. 
It became the headquarters of newspapers, lawyers, different professionals from about 1853 to 1890. It was the only major downtown building to survive the 1906 earthquake and fire. And this in the background, this is Jackson Square. And there you would see that's where Montgomery Block once stood. And now it's the site, as I said, of the Transamerica Pyramid. This area had a very colorful name. And excuse me, just um, before I tell you it's the name of it, it's, it's curious names. Uh, this is a photograph just after the earthquake and fires. And to the right here is Monkey Block. This is Jackson Square. And as you can see, there's devastation all around. But this building built of concrete would have been, it was one of the only ones that survived. Rumor has it also that it owes its uh, survival, that it owed its survival to um, the proximity to a whiskey factory over here, somewhere in Jackson Square. I've heard that story a few times and um, maybe someone can let me know if it's apocryphal or true. By the time, by the 1890s, 1900s, the um, monkey block, which is the nickname that Montgomery Block takes on at this time, by about this time, um, the building falls into disrepair. And this is when the artists come slinking and slithering and sashaying in. This is from a novel, actually. It's a crime novel set in Montgomery Block. And um, you can see the this uh, little caption here, the disreputable old building at 706 Montgomery Street, uh, San Francisco turned out to be the perfect hangout, not just for artists and writers, but also for murder. Um, this is a novel that shows, uh, that shows Monkey Block in its heyday, so to speak, the time when it was populated by artists and writers. There were about 800 artists and writers and musicians and journalists who lived in this building, including Mark Twain. When Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera came through town in 1930, they also stopped in. Um, it was for a time a wondrous place and the hub of Bohemian San Francisco life. This is the only picture I've ever seen from inside Monkey Block. So this is um, Columbus Avenue. You're looking up to Columbus. It's a, it's a procession. Uh, the president has actually come through town and this photograph is taken from within Montgomery Block. I've never seen any other photographs taken from within the building itself. So this is a pretty special image. It was taken by Ken Cathcart, who was a map maker as well. Dorothea Lang to the right over here, gains her entree into monkey block in this bohemian scene through her um, romance and eventual marriage to Maynard Dixon, who's over on the left over here. Maynard Dixon was almost 20 years older than Dorothea Lang. He was when they met in 1918, 19, um, 1919, a very celebrated painter. He was called the King of Bohemia. So Montgomery Block, he had a studio very close by and he was one of the most colorful of a band of very colorful characters. Um, when, uh, when they marry in 1920, there's a piece that runs in the Chronicle, I think, with the title, Bride Keeps Identity. That's the actual um, headline <laughs> announcing their marriage, which tells you something about the times and the way women um, were regarded when they married. Uh, it was meant that she was planning to do the very unorthodox thing of, to keep uh, working even after her marriage. One of the pleasures of writing The Bohemians was bringing this milieu back to life. So bringing Monkey Block back to life, bringing characters like Maynard Dixon, here he is on the left in a caricature. Um, in the center, there he is walking probably around the financial district with a canvas under one arm and his 10 gallon hat on his head. He's probably got his cowboy boots on and he's got a silver tip cane. And there he goes through San Francisco. One of the great pleasures of writing the novel was bringing these characters back to life. It's a place that doesn't exist. So I hear from people, even people who are third and fourth generation San Franciscans, they've never heard of a place called Monkey Block. And that's because it was torn down in the 1950s. And this is a photograph that was taken during its destruction. 
Unfortunately, it survived the earthquake only to be destroyed um, as urban development was taking over the city. It missed, um, it, it missed historic preservation movement, the historic preservation movement by just a few years. Maybe if it had made it a few years longer, we'd still have it, but it wasn't. And it was torn down in the late fifties. It became a parking lot for a time and then it became the Transamerica Pyramid. But back to when it was still the vibrant hub of Bohemian uh, San Francisco. The, uh, the novel opens uh, with Dorothea Lange falling into this world through Caroline Lee, her, her first friend in San Francisco. Caroline Lee has an apartment in this building. Uh, it's one of the few places that'll rent to her as a mi mixed race woman. She has a really tough go of it and it's only among these artists that she's able to find a home. Here are some of those San Francisco Bohemians, uh, painters and writers. This is a, surely a stage shot, but one of the things that I love about the picture is that there are women in it. Um, there are women in there arguing and drinking and they're right up in the scene. Um, things were not equal, but it is extraordinary that in San Francisco, women were present and they were part of the, of the artistic scene. This is Copas, which is one of the main um, one of the main settings in Bohemians. It was a restaurant in Montgomery Block, and this is where the poor, the impoverished artists would come, and sometimes they would exchange their art for a plate of pasta and some tiramisu. Maybe they would paint murals on the walls of Copas, and uh, in exchange, they'd get food to eat. Here's a menu to Copas, and. Now I'm gonna take you to a little deeper into Lang's story here. So to, to give you a sense of where Dorothea Lang comes in, what she's doing in San Francisco when she comes in 1918, um, I have to tell you first a little bit about women and photography at this time in, in history. So women have been part of American photography almost from its inception. By the end of the 19th century, um, women were beginning to pursue higher education. They were beginning to enter the professions. And at the same time, photography is emerging. So women are emerging and photography is emerging as a, as a um, form of livelihood and artistic practice. There are better and better, better um, printing uh, processes and smaller cameras uh, by the likes of George e Eastman, his 1888 Kodak camera eliminates, eliminates the need for really heavy equipment, making it even more accessible to women. And photography is really something that's sold to women um, through its signature Kodak girl, the Eastman campaign, like the this uh, later campaign, the Brownie Girl, encouraged thousands of women to take up photography. And this campaign laid the groundwork for a legacy of talented women like Dorothea Lange entering art photography, portrait photography, and photojournalism. However, while women were coming into photography, um, there were these illusions that women somehow had this special feminine grace and sensibility that made them uniquely suited to portrait photography. And that's the kind of photographer that Dorothea Lange was when she first, when she first started out. Um, there was this notion that women were particularly skilled at um, unveiling a sitter's inner character, getting into their emotional life. Toward the end of the 19th century and into the 19 teens, the practice of taking portraits in the home was a way that women like Lang entered the profession of photography. Um, let's see, before she became the extraordinary photographer who took images like Migrant Mother, who was photographing the blighted streets and roadways of the depression, before, long before this, Dorothea Lange was a society photographer in 1920 San Francisco. And this is the brochure to Lange's studio at 540 Sutter Street. The building still stands. You can still go there. There are no tenant, there's no tenant at the moment, but you can go right up to the gate and, and you'll see 
what was the site of Dorothea Lange's first studio in San Francisco. Dorothea Lange said, I was the one you went to if you could afford it, she said, with a mix of pride, I think, and irony. It seems almost like an impossible contradiction. How could a photographer who becomes so closely associated with the poor have spent so many years of her career, about 10 or 12, catering to the fabulously wealthy? Well, Lang's background offers some clues. She was born uh, to a middle-class family of German, uh, German origin. She grew up in Hoboken, New Jersey. She uh, fell ill with polio when she was seven years old and that would mark her for the rest of her life. She was bedridden and walked with a limp um, all of her life. Her father abandoned the family when she was 12 years old and she, Dorothea Lang was raised by a single mother. While her, while her family was never totally destitute, Dorothea Lang knew from the time she was a child what it was like to be lost, to be financially insecure, and to be in dire straits. And I think you see that later in her work. But as a young woman, she really doesn't have the option to go to university. She doesn't have the option to get any particular, you know, any fancy training. She has to cobble together apprenticeships. And so she does not think of herself as an artist. She, she thinks of herself as a tradeswoman. And the work that she produces, she's very proud of because she's able to support herself. Not a small thing in these years, especially with, coming from Lang's background with her family not encouraging her at all. Her mother wanted her to become a teacher. Um, she was not interested in that at all, but she really had to forge her way forward by herself. She didn't have mentors and models and um, any kind of, you know, assured place at all in, in this field. Her dream when she was young was to travel the world and she only made it as far as San Francisco. Um, I'll, I can tell you about that a little bit more, but when she comes to San Francisco, she is robbed the first day, true story, the first day Dorothea Lang gets to San Francisco, she's robbed and she has no money. She has to take a job at a five and dime shop and she gets a room at the Mary Elizabeth Inn, which, is, which was a boarding house for single women. A little bit over a year later, she's running this studio at 540 Sutter Street, one of the most successful portrait studios in the city. By force of her wits and her hard work, she had set up shop near Union Square, the city's toniest shopping district, calling herself Miss Lang. She, um, she also supported her husband. So Dorothea Lang and Maynard Dixon marry in 1920. He's the famous big name at the time. And while he lives out the bohemian dream, she's working to support him. She's working so that he doesn't have to do commercial work, which he hates. She's also supporting, once they have children, she's supporting the children as well through her work. It doesn't seem that Lang resented this, not in the beginning at least. She was proud of her success, proud of her ability to support her family. Um, and she didn't seem to feel inferior to her clientele. So what you're looking at are some of these early photographs from Lang Studio at 540 Sutter Street. She's photographing the creme de la creme of San Francisco society. We're talking about the Levi Strausses and the um, Fleischhockers and you know the, the sort of roll call of the who's who of San Francisco at this time. They are Dorothea Lang's clients. Uh, she actually thought of herself as a kind of educator. So she didn't think, even though there was a wide distance between her and her clientele, she thought of herself as kind of someone who could enlighten her patrons about the new art, uh, relatively new art of photography. And for their part, a lot of her uh, clients were progressive and open-minded and um, they had an appreciation for the arts and they were open to her different ways of taking portraits. Now, these portraits that you're looking at, they might not seem revolutionary and they weren't radical, but they were definitely, they had, def had a different spirit than most traditional portraits. So if you think of the traditional portrait, it's, it's um, very staid, people are almost costumed, no smiles. Um, Dorothea Lang had a really different kind, uh, different, really different idea of what portrait photographs should be. 
She really felt like a photograph should show the inside so that it should reflect something of the essence of the person. So she did away with the fussy um, backdrops and she liked to photograph her subjects in their regular clothes. So no fancy, you know, Sunday best, but rather the, the kind of garments they would have been wearing in the home um, in, in less formal moments of their lives. And she had a, a really wonderful touch with her clients. This is Edith Catton, actually, who is um, a light, became a lifelong friend of Lang's. Actually, they became genuine friends. Women like Edith Catton were um, were educated. They were part of the city's cultural um, elite, but they were also dedicated to building up San Francisco San Francisco's cultural institutions. And, um, and so it was actually, Lang didn't feel like she was compromising. She felt that she was giving something to this clientele and that she, she also was, was at least, she felt, um, she felt that she was participating in the lives of people who were bringing beauty to San Francisco. That's how she saw her work in these years. This is Dorothea Lang in her studio at 540 Setter Street. It's a hazy image, but there she is holding her camera for a photographer. I don't know, maybe this, is a, this isn't that atypical, but she didn't like to be photographed much. So I don't have a lot of photographs of Dorothea Lang, but here she is in her studio at 540 Sutter Street. These images that I'm showing you, they've been beautifully archived and curated and digitized by the Oakland Museum of California. So if you are interested, I would definitely head over to their archive. Um, because they are represented wonderfully in the Oakland Museum of California's um, uh, series of her work. So let's see if we go. Now, when she comes to San Francisco, another thing that was so wondrous and wonderful to write about were the women who become her friends. These are characters in the Bohemians. All of them, they were all so extraordinary. They all deserve novels, and I wish I had, <laughs> I wish I could write novels about all of them, but it was for sure so much fun to bring them in and to show the company that Dorothea Lang kept when she came. You're looking at an image by one of those photographers. This is Alma Levinson's self um, self portrait, she called this. It was uh, her self portrait that she took. So San Francisco had always been. Sorry, let me back up for a second. So San Francisco had always been a pretty welcoming place for artists, uh, but it was actually the 1906 earthquake and fires that kicked open the door for women. The established photography photographers, what, what there was, the, the figures there were, left San Francisco at this time. People like Arnold Gente, who was actually the, um, was one of Dorothea Lange's mentors. He went to Carmel and then he went to New York. So the establishment scatters after the 1906 earthquake. And this creates actually a vacuum, which is where the women photographers come in. Of necessity and temperament, these women, um, these women are uh, making their own money and they're taking groundbreaking pictures and sustaining each other's careers. That's also a really interesting thing, the way that these women support each other. As each of these women asked what kind of pictures she wanted to take, she also faced the question of what kind of life she wanted to live. And it was in looking at one another that the members of this group, Dorothea Lang and her crew, so to speak, began to answer that question for themselves. This is Anne Brickman. So I'm gonna briefly introduce you to a few of these women, these amazing women, and then I'm gonna um, switch over to question and answer time, but not without first introducing you to a few of these women. So Anne Brickman uh, was, uh, was already making photographs long before Dorothea Lang ever came to California. Um, beginning in 1901, two decades before Lang arrived, she, Anne Brigman, was already trekking up to the Sierra Nevada, photographing herself at the edge of a cliff like a swaggering buccaneer, or else posing nude in the crook of a wind-warped tree. And 
here she is. Um, this is a photograph that was taken. This figure right here is Anne Brigman, and it was taken in Dorothea Lange's studio. I think this is Dorothea Lange right here. Um, but these are all photographers. And the point of the photograph is, um, is that they are paying homage to the woman who started, um, who started it off for them in California. Women especially felt a kinship with her because she was such a renegade. Um, but you see here, I think the cheekiness and the joy and the pleasure they had in each other's company. And, um, and there is Anne Brigman residing over it all at 540 Sutter Street. And Dorothea Lange's studio was a kind of salon. It was a place where artists would gather in, um, in the nighttime hours. She put away her photography equipment and it became the place where the Bohemians would gather. A few pictures. Here she is, is that swaggering buccaneer. This is a self-portrait she took up in the Sierra Nevada. And here you've got we call them nowadays nude selfies is really what she was taking. Art photographs um, that were taken up in, um, up in the mountains there near, um, near Lake Tahoe that showcased women's bodies, the nude, um, and this beautiful kinship, this beautiful affinity between the female form and the landscape. This is Anne Brigman's portrait of Isadora Duncan. So she also photographed other women artists. And that's really interesting too, that all of these women love to photograph other accomplished women. They were really dedicated to showing off each other's um, successes. So interesting. And I think this is my final Anne Brigman shot. So she did extraordinary landscape photographs, but she didn't only do landscape photographs. She was um, quite a, a accomplished also as um, a studio photographer. This is Imogen Cunningham. This is one of the first women that Dorothea Lang meets when she comes to San Francisco. She was more established than Lang when they met. She had already run a portrait studio in Seattle. And while she continued to do portrait work to support herself, she was already making art photography. So remember, Dorothea Lange at this time doesn't think of herself as an artist. She thinks of herself as a tradeswoman, woman. but she's looking at these other women who are doing really interesting work and the seeds are planted. It's beginning, it's beginning to brew in her. It won't come to fruition until the 1930s, but it's among these women observing their work that she begins to see what photography can be. Imogen Cunningham, when Dorothea Lange meets her, she is living in what she feels is exile up in the Oakland Hills. She has two small children, but as Dory, Dorothea says in the novel that even in those, uh, even in that situation, Imogen Cunningham made beauty. She made extraordinary photographs, even when she was um, up in those Oakland foothills, minding two children, she was actively photographing and, and taking really beautiful um, photographs of her children and the, the environment around the house. Here she is a few years on where she's not, she's not in the throes of that, not quite deep in that exile anymore. And here are a few of Imogen Cunningham's photograph. So this is, I think this is also a self-portrait. She also took nude portraits of um, male subjects, which was really renegade, very revolutionary at the time and got her into trouble. Not that it stopped her. Another Imogen Cunningham photograph. And here, another photograph of Cunningham's. I told you that these women photographers love to photograph other women artists. This is Imogen Cunningham's portrait of Frida Kahlo. Kahlo comes in 1930 to San Francisco. In those years, she was called Mrs. Rivera. No one was paying much attention to Frida Kahlo, but Imogen Cunningham was paying attention to Frida Kahlo and she pulled her aside and she took some really extraordinary photographs, portraits of Frida Kahlo, a young Frida Kahlo, who was just, just beginning to fashion herself. She later would photograph Ruth Asawa, the San Francisco sculptor. They became lifelong friends. She also has beautiful photographs of uh, dancers, of dancers over at Mills College. I don't have those as part of my presentation. And Imogen 
took photographs all her life. I love these pictures of Imogen until her, you know, very, very, very late in her life, just months, months before she died, she was still taking photographs. And I've heard stories from people that they remember Imogen Cunningham walking around North Beach. And she always, always had her camera flung around her neck. And the last of the women, um, and I'm nearly, nearly done with my presentation, is Consuelo Canaga. So in this milieu of Imogen Cunningham and Alma Levinson, Consuela Canaga is, um, is turning her eye uh, to um, also to the streets and she's working as one of the first women photojournalists in the country. So she's working for one of the Hearst publications when Dorothea Lang meets her. And um, she is, uh, she is, she absolutely, <laughs> she blows Dorothea Lang away. Um, Dorothea Lang, I'll give you her description of Consuelo Canaga when they meet. Let me go back a second. Um, she lived in a Portuguese hotel in North Beach, which was entirely Portuguese working men, except for Consuelo. She would go anywhere and do anything. That's that, that's the essence of Consuelo Canaga for Dorothea Lang. And remember, Lang is a studio photographer. She is not in the streets. Here's Consuelo Canaga at least a decade um, before Lang doing photojournalism out in the streets. And then most, you know, maybe most notably, she is taking beautiful portraits of people of color. This becomes a signature of her work. Um, she takes beautiful portraits of, um, of many different communities, African-Americans among them. I'll just show you a couple of Consuela Kanaga's portraits. This is Kanaga's portrait of Langston Hughes. And this is her famous, probably her most famous image. She is a tree of life to them. All right. And also another one of Consuela Kanaga, an action shot. All right, this is the, my last photograph. I love this photograph so much. It is um, over here, it is Imogen Cunningham. This is Alma Levinson and this is Consuelo Canaga. They were friends all their lives. So they met as young women. They supported each other in all kinds of ways. They lent each other space in their dark rooms. They uh, advanced each other's names in different um, photography establishments at different shows. They were each other's champions. And I love this photograph because here they are um, in the later stages of their life. They're still together and they're still, they're still taking pictures. They are restless and they are insatiable. This is the novel where you can find their stories. And, um, and also this is a companion guide. If you like this kind of thing, these kind of pictures and stories, I collected them in a guide to Bohemian San Francisco. You can easily access that um, over on my website, which actually has also a lot of other photographs. So I'm gonna pop out of my screen share and I've got, looks like I'm right at time. Yes, that was amazing. That was like the perfect women's history event. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. And Christina, I welcome you to pop on too, if you like kind of, um, there is one question, and I know as we like start, the people will start putting the questions in. So I'm going to grab the one question from our Q&A, which was, um, did artists just take over the monkey block or was it like a <laughs> city sanctioned kind of thing? That sounds like a great idea to me. Yeah, I know. I mean, we could really use something like that or a few things few buildings like that. You know, it just, it kind of got run down is what happened. I think the landlords just weren't taking care of it and the rents went way down. So at a certain time, it was a really sort of fabulous building, but then lawyers and these different professionals went down to Market Street, established themselves over there. So rents get real cheap at Monkey Block. And that's, and that's the reason the artists come in is they can get a studio. They love, if you, if you remember maybe the photograph they at uh, a monkey block the they had wonderfully tall tall windows painters loved that they also loved that proximity in north beach they loved that it was sort of at this intersection of world because you've got north beach on the one side and then you've also got chinatown so yeah it was cheap and um and 
but it didn't last, right? So, so it lasted until it didn't. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Christina Moretta. She's our curator from the San Francisco History Center in the photo collection. And I'd like to just turn it over to you, Christina, to ask Jasmine what came up for you while you watched the presentation. And like I said, we put those chat, I knew Christina would be throwing down some chats and there's some great links. So I'm gonna put that main link in that has everything for you all. Take it away, Christina. Oh, thanks. Thanks for sharing all that. That was really fun. Um, it's, uh, I appreciate all the photos you collected for your research. Um, and then did you use more of photos to inspire you or did you mm -hmm. kind of do a lot more reading or just kind of let for your writing process? I'm just curious. Yeah, well, as a writer, I think my way into the past or into history are stories. So I did start by reading everything I could, any historical accounts, memoirs, biographies, all of that. But I'm writing about photographers. So, of course, I had to study Lang's work for one, the work of these other photographers. And then to get that to get that wonderful sort of texture and details, photographs are wonderful for evoking the spirit of a place. Um, so I think they were they were really important to me. And I found myself as I was writing, you know, intermittently, I'd go back and steep myself in the images and let myself be sort of moved and inspired by them. And then I'd run back to the, the keyboard and I'd try to transmit those feelings, um, what I was seeing into stories. And that last photo was fantastic. It's just like of the three of them as photographers. I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> I know. So wonderful. Um, do you have like a crossover um, work? Do you do art too, Jasmine? I don't, but I teach at CCA, which is an arts college. And I, I think that the, the germ of this was really teaching at an arts college and learning over time that part of how I was going to connect with the students was to become more knowledgeable about visual art. So I don't know, I didn't know much about photography or painting, but I became increasingly interested and I started to bring more photography into my classes. I teach, um, I teach 20th century American literature and that it just became a wonderful way of making the literature come alive for the students, but it also transformed me so that I was becoming I, you know, I wouldn't call myself an expert by any means, but that's the wonderful thing about being a writer is I think you can, you can, you can become, you know, knowledgeable about these different fields. For a couple of years, I lived with this photographer and I had to know in order to write about her, I had to know, I had to know some things about photography and, and what it was like to do this work at that time. Looks like we have a couple questions here. Um, one is, would you like to talk about the ratio of fact to fiction in the Bohemian? <laughs> I love that. I wish I had, you know, a number. Um, there's a point in the novel where Dorothea says um, about herself and the other main character, Caroline Lee, she said she was one part fiction, one part fact. And as I wrote that, I was absolutely also talking. <laughs> now, is it equal? <laughs> Um, I follow history, I follow the grain of history. So I would never tell a story that went against facts that I knew to be true. So I wouldn't make, um, I wouldn't make things up. I would want, if Dorothea Lang were to come back, I would want her to recognize herself. She might not like, you know, she, she might not like that I took her on as a subject, but I think you do owe a certain responsibility as, as a writer of this kind of fiction. If you're gonna put Lang's name on, on the, you know, in the pages and, uh, and you're gonna make it explicitly about her, I think there is a, a higher burden, you know? So the place where I invented more though was with respect to that Chinese American assistant. So there was an opportunity. What I really like to do is find these places where I feel the presence of a story, but there's an absence of the story. So when I come up, across this reference to Lang's Chinese American assistant, it's just a paragraph in the biography of Lang, but oh my God, <laughs> you know, was I fascinated and I had to know who was this woman? Where did she come from? What was their collaboration like? That would have been such an interesting meeting of worlds, these two women. Um, and that's where I invented more. Still informed by a lot of research, but I think in this case, it seemed to, it, at least to me, it serves a certain higher purpose. And that's that you're filling in a gap where history just didn't, didn't tell the story. 
Um, I think you're kind of like touched upon this, but um, if you want to add a little bit about your creative process for researching and writing Bohemians, mm -hmm. but I feel like you've touched a little bit upon it, but if there was an extra nugget you wanted to add. Yeah, I mean, I, everything really for me started with monkey block. I just, I was so fascinated. Unfortunately, you can't write a novel about a building. You have to put people in it and you have to make them do things. So um, so I, I scouted around and I fastened on pretty pretty early on. I fastened on to Lang. Um, she was interesting to, to me for lots of reasons. So I think the process is really, the way I would describe it is, you're using your curiosity as a compass. I use my curiosity as a compass. So I was curious about monkey block. I was curious about this woman who was had polio, came over, was robbed. There was just so much that captivated me about Lang. And I really, I, I've learned over the course of three books to trust my curiosity and to let it guide me. There's a fun YouTube question, which oh. Um, what uh what's the next fabulous woman you're gonna write about oh there's so many um the next fabulous woman is an actress in old hollywood so i'm already on the case i'm working on it now it is a story set in hollywood in the 1930s and 40s and um i don't think i can disclose her name but it is absolutely another fabulous woman whose story has to be told that um and here's some library and love questions, um, <laughs> <laughs> which are um, just kind of like where folks can learn more about these women and more about them, yeah. maybe where you did some of your research and found information, and especially the places you found information to build on for the lead character. For the lead character. Well, Oakland Museum of California, if you're interested in Ling, absolutely go there first. Um, there have been a couple of terrific exhibitions in New York. The, I think it was a Met, put on the woman behind the camera. It was all about the new woman. So women of the 1920s who went into photography. I'd recommend that book. Um, and then of course, scour the index and you know that will lead you to other more precise sources. Um, let's see other, I think for Lang, the, the place to go first is the Linda Gordon biography, Dorothea Lang, A Life Beyond Limits. That's where I'd go. There's also a terrific uh, PBS documentary about Lang called Dorothea Lang, Grab a Hunk of Lightning. At the end of Bohemians, I've got a whole list of suggested materials. That's perfect. Yeah, and they did a great um, exhibition of Ann Brigman photos um, at the Reno yeah. Art Museum. And there's a great catalog for it. Beautiful. I've actually, it's behind me somewhere. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So that was really, um, so for, in regards to, of course, library and resources, mm -hmm. we have a lot of the, usually the catalogs for those shows too. Um, let's see. And then our earlier question was, and maybe now that you kind of dropped some of your next project, but any parallel movement of female photographers in Los Angeles at that same time? Did you come across that? There was a Bohemia in Los Angeles and there is, um, there's actually a book with Bohemia in the title about the art scene down there. One of the figures I'm thinking of is Tina Modati who was associated with um, Edward Weston they, Tina Modati was from San Francisco, but she, when, when Bohemians takes place, they're in Los Angeles and, um, and this book, which, oh my gosh, I, I am blanking on the title, but this book about, um, the Bohemian scene down in Los Angeles at the time, um, tells a great story of the artists, uh, around that circle. That's funny. Cause I just recently got it's a Tina Modotti book that they used our photos, um, but it's in Italian. <laughs> I was like, I just have that on my desk. Um, let's see, I think we got most of the questions. Um, oh, over in the chat, um, if, it, if, you know, in regards to writing, if you'd like to share some of your daily writing practice mm. that you have. All right, um, <laughs> it's tough and I'm not gonna say I always follow this advice, but I think it's great if you can spend some time every day, even if it's 15 minutes on your project so that you're 
you always feel tethered to it in some way. So that could mean for me that I'm just going to set a timer and I'm going to write for 15 minutes. And I really mean it. That's all I'm going to do. But doing that, I think, then invites your subconscious to work on it, even when you're not working on it. And uh, and so then when you are when you are able to go back and you have more time, there isn't such a struggle to get back into the story. So keeping up a routine of some kind, some connection is important. I think it's great if you have a community or just even a partner or somebody to hold you accountable. That's terrific. Um, that really has transformed my life. I still exchange. The first person who sees my writing is my best friend who I met in a writing workshop 15 years ago. And, um, and her presence in my life, just knowing there's someone who's going to bug me if I'm not writing has been terrific. It's been you know, life-changing really. So I'd say, yeah, that's another thing that's really important. I tried to keep up as you all were talking, but like um, Jasmine said, and Christina, there's many resources out there, especially at our library, of course, but in our Bay Area, we are so fortunate to have all these great resources. So this is a live document and I will put a couple more, maybe I can talk Christina into throwing in a couple more resources. I'm going to throw it in the chat one last time. Mm -hmm. Can I say one tiny thing about the San Francisco Public Library? <laughs> Is it was an amazing resource. And um, if you go up to the sixth floor, a kind librarian, you I went up and I said, show me what you got on monkey block. And a, a magician showed up and gave me a file with all things monkey block. So oh, that's us. We're magical. Yep. All right, Jasmine and Christina, thank you for making my Women's History Month even better. This was so good. It was such a lovely hour. I appreciate it. And appreciate you both joining us and library community. Absolutely appreciate you the mostest. All right, friends. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you soon, community. Thank you.